Hey friends, welcome to our community here at Wonderfully Made. We're a movement of women who are walking in our God-given identity, value, and purpose. I'm your co-host, Christy Myers, and I'm so glad you're here. Let's dive into today's conversation. That's a really bad thought. Something's wrong with me, right? That doesn't come from God. It comes from the enemy. So what I want to shine a line on is that the thoughts you're having are a lot of the same thoughts I'm having and have had. We have to switch these narratives, change them, design new patterns, untangle ourselves from these bad beliefs with the truth. We're back for part two on decluttering your soul with Trina McNeely. This is the second episode of a two-part series focused on creating a life of more spaciousness and peace and joy, an uncluttered Mm -hmm. internal life. So in the last episode, we learned about what soul clutter is, the different types, the role of awareness, and the process of decluttering. And today, we're going to dive deeper and talk about the role of our inner dialogues and the importance of addressing deep-rooted pain in order to move forward into more internal peace. So I'm really, I'm so excited about this episode. This, I would say, this is my jam, the stuff that we're going to be talking about. So, and, and all of this is for all of you who are joining us today. We're so glad you're here. The whole purpose of this is, and Trina, you say this so well in your book, to really cultivate hearts where we want to dwell Mm. and where we can Mm. dwell with Jesus. This is not work that we're doing alone. And so I love how you pointed that out as Mm. we started. So welcome back. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. (laughs) So let's start, let's just dive right into the deep Mm -hmm. stuff. This internal dialogues, also known as sometimes old narratives that can hold us back from peace Mm -hmm. and joy and all the things that we really want. If we don't change the script, do you like, can you start us maybe just share from your own life, how this has showed up for you and yeah, just anything you want to share about how it showed up and how you've worked to flip the script. Yeah. I think it's just like internal dialogue, right? Before that word narrative became very popular. Nobody used that, but we always, of course, had stories going on in our head. And I am notorious for that because I like stories. So I'll make them up sometimes. I think we all do. We hear something and then it starts something. And then it's great using the word script too, because it makes me think of if you go with that whole like acting vibe, you've got the script, but you also have to rehearse, right? So whatever these scripts are, we are rehearsing them over and over in our minds to the point that they can sometimes become like a false belief or obviously like a pattern, a thought pattern. So for me, I have lots of them and observing was a great way to begin to start to name some of those. And it's not, you're going to sit down with a pen and paper and You can and try to pay attention to what's there, but it's just, it's really going to be a process. You might come up with one and notice, boy, I'm thinking that a lot. And again, we talked about this in the first episode, but the Holy Spirit is really key in this process of uncluttering our soul. And so when we, I look at it, like submitting myself to this process and a surrender to it, then he'll begin to point things out. Like you'll just notice, oh, I am thinking that a lot. And where did that come from? When did I start thinking that? Or why do I believe that? Or did somebody say that to me when I was a child? Did I come up with that on my own? And boy, this is going through my head often. Or maybe when says this, then I think that, and I'm noticing I'm doing that with in conversation when other people are talking too. So I have a lot, of course. I think as I went through a really difficult decade really. And I write about this in the book and my first one, couple ones that I would catch myself thinking all the time are like, I'm stuck. I can't, this is things will never change or things are always going to be complicated and difficult. Some of it can be like a self-protection mechanism too, right? Cause it's like, you're s- trying to protect yourself from disappointment, but it doesn't really work that way. You can't. So you just tell yourself things like that. Things are always going to be difficult or hard. I started to really constantly be like, oh, I don't have a lot of energy. I don't think I am a very high energy person compared to some of my friends, but I just kept saying it and thinking it. And it was really working against me. And one that we talked about in the last episode in the form of wishing for some kind of rescue is I'm all alone. 
which if you look at my life, you would say, no, you're not. You have a house full of people. You do have a lot of friends, really good people. You do have family, but, but I felt lonely because I felt lonely in the pain I was dealing with. And so that converted to, I am alone. Yes. Oh, these, it's interesting that you say, if we repeat them, it do actually become a false belief and sort of an yeah. identity that we take on. Yes. Yeah. And one of the ones that God healed me from, and we, so if you're just tuning in now, the first episode that we did just talk, lays the groundwork for what are, what is internal clutter? And a lot of it is about dialogues. It's about our internal narratives. So if you miss that one, please go back, look at it in the archives. But so for me, fast forward now, here we are part two, talking about the deeper layers here. I had this false belief identity that I had taken on. And it sounded like this to me. I'm yeah. the time it would play over and over again in my head. Mm -hmm. So tired. And it was exhausting to hear it all the time. I yeah. thought yeah, I just, that was my no energy one. I'm so tired. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Just living. And it was like this, it was like this exhaustion identity that I was living into one day. I'm like, am I really that tired? Or do I just keep telling myself over and over again? The yeah. other one was actually far more dangerous for me. And it was this, what's wrong with me? I realized once I started paying attention, like you were talking about, first step of observe, pay attention, think about what you're thinking about. This thought was one of the seven thoughts that governed my mind. There's a, there's an exercise you can do mm -hmm. if you're listening today. I think I only got down to thought three or four that was like, I was readily able to write down, but it was one of the top ones and it was what's wrong with me. And this is a thought that would play itself over and over again in my head every day. And I was extremely insecure. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much it was impacting me until I prayed with somebody and really got to the heart of it and invited Jesus in and went back mm -hmm. to some childhood memories and the origin of that belief and got into, oh, I believe this as a little girl, there was something that was wrong with me. It's mm -hmm. not true. Yeah. And then the healing started from there and mm -hmm. it was really powerful. Yeah. I, what I love is, and I've had that thought too. So what I want to shine a light on is a lot of those types of thoughts. That's just a really bad thought. Something's wrong with me, right? That doesn't come from God. It comes from the enemy. And so the enemy, he can't create anything new. He just spins things and uses lies and so forth. So what I want to shine a line on is that the thoughts you're having are a lot of the same thoughts I'm having and have had, and that so many listeners have had those same thoughts. So you may be listening today and thinking, oh yeah, that's me. It's the enemy. He really tries to work double time. And so the, the way that we have to switch these narratives, change them, design new patterns, untangle ourselves from these bad beliefs is with the truth. That's the only way. And for me, and I'm going to guess for you too, the truth is God's word. And so when, you know, there's thoughts like what's wrong with me, or there's something wrong with me, or I'm all alone, I'm stuck, I'm tired, whatever, there is truth to every one of the thoughts that you think in God's word, right? And so we have to do the work of getting into the word and looking and seeing what does God say about this? God says you're fearfully and wonderfully made that he planned for you before the origins of the world, before he created anything, you were in his mind and his heart. And that there's a verse, he energizes the souls in tired bodies. I think it's in Isaiah and it's probably the message version, but I love that because in a season where I'm so tired, I'm so tired, I have no energy. I could read that and be like, yeah, God can energize me. And even when I'm weak, God is strong. Like weakness is not a bad place to be because then God's strength can really work and show out in my life. So we have to go to God's word and see what he says, meditate on those words and begin to design new patterns and new narratives. And it's, it can be a tedious work sometimes. Sometimes, you know, you, it happens the way that you described and praying and there can be freedom. And other times it's anytime that thought comes to mind, replacing it with a truth thought from God's word until that is on repeat in your mind more than yeah. the other thought. I think it's always both, to be honest. 
Yeah. From my experience and everybody has their own, but my experience has been that there is, that healing is always a process, that changing the script is always a process and that it takes, like we were talking about earlier, it takes an act of the will combined with the participation with the mm -hmm. spirit of God in yeah. order to transform our mind and live mm -hmm. into our true identity to shed mm -hmm. these false layers. It makes me think of C.S. Lewis's novel where that, where Eustace, I think his name is, he's the, this kid, not very nice, right? And he ends up in this dragon skin and he actually has to let Aslan, who represents God, Jesus, in the novel, tear the dragon skin off of him so that his mm -hmm. true self can emerge. And mm -hmm. it's a painful process, some of it, and he has to yield his will and be willing to be mm -hmm. vulnerable and trust Aslan. And I think mm -hmm. that is, there is an aspect to getting past these narratives where we have to be willing to be vulnerable with the spirit mm -hmm. of God. Like you're saying, it's being willing to take him at his word in the, through scripture yeah. And it's also being willing to take him at his word through the Holy Spirit and trust him because this thought comes to mind. Jesus is a gentleman. He doesn't knock down doors. He overturned mm -hmm. tables once right. when people were exploiting other people, but right. he's a God of justice. But in my own life, he has always shown up as a gentleman. Yeah. And yeah, I mm -hmm. agree with you. The word of God is an essential component and that ongoing work of, oh, there is that thought again. Am I? No, I'm not. That's not true. So for yeah. me, I, I came up with a visualization of this is really from the Holy Spirit, I believe. But he just gave me this picture of whenever I would start to feel like, what's wrong with me? Be like, no, there's nothing wrong with you. That was the line he gave me. There's nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with me. God loves me. He made me just the way he wanted me. And then yeah. I would have this picture of Jesus's hand over my heart, calming my heart mm -hmm. down. I love that probably going to cry. And then like my mascara is going to go again <laughs> in the last episode. I'm like at the end, why do I have black marks on my face? Yeah. And I would love to add to that too. Don't keep anything that we keep in the dark. These kinds of things can grow. I know that goes against like plant life, but we have to bring things into the light. Anything that we need healing on, or we want to change, we have to bring it into the light. So if you have a trusted friend, like maybe share with them the thought that you're having, because Friends are awesome for reminding you what is true. Sometimes we can be so in the thick of it that it's hard to remind ourselves. And so if we can surround ourselves with people that can remind us of truth and remind us of what's true and the good, that can be a real game changer and a real like power boost in the process. So don't keep those things to yourself. In recovery, there's the saying, we're only as sick as our secrets. And our thought life is very much a secret life from what, I mean, it is unless we share parts of it. Share those things. Don't keep them hidden. When you talked about praying with someone, that's a perfect example because we want to support each other. What you've shared with me has been helpful to me today. And I hope what we're both sharing is helpful to others. Yeah. Don't keep those narratives hidden. I love the word. Like I can see all your writer, all these great analogies, these word pictures that you paint. <laughs> so helpful. <laughs> And when you were sharing that thing about everything seems bigger in the dark, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's this vivid picture, right? Like when we walk outside at night and it's actually a bunny, like walking through the bushes, but it's like, oh, what's in the bushes? And then in the light of day, it's, oh, that wasn't even a bunny. It was a lizard. <laughs> it was the smallest little thing. And it seems so big and so scary because it was dark and turn on a little bit of light. And I just think about how you can hold up a hand in the dark There's when there's only a little bit of light and the shadow can look so big, right? These small things cast these big shadows, but turn the light all the way up and you see right. it for what it really is. It's a yeah. great picture. Yeah, definitely. So two for women who are here with us today who are recognizing that there are some narratives that they're dealing with, some maybe false, false identities, even in the things mm -hmm. that they're telling themselves, how would you, a lot of that is like, we've talked about connected with childhood pain. Can you just share just any words of, of wisdom, any insights on how to, mm -hmm. how that, um, 
maybe how Jesus has shown up for you, or I don't know, just a- anything that you want to share, Trina, regarding that. Yeah. I think as we do this kind of work, God always takes us back, even if we're like, oh, that's not on my agenda. Like I, like I said, I love to observe. I like to analyze. I like to verbally process to the point of driving my husband insane. <laughs> but so I was doing part of my story that I share in both my books is that my parents divorced when I was an adult. We were living in my childhood home. It came out of nowhere. I wasn't expecting it. There was a lot of addiction problems going on in my family then that imploded that at the time, then grandparents started dying. It was just one thing after the other, so much loss. And so of course, as I'm living in the home that I grew up in, that was like my safest place as while like my identity as I knew it was falling apart it really was difficult to not look back a lot. I was in this, what I call museum of memories. So I was looking back a lot, but at that point I was just trying to survive it. I had little kids, babies at the time, and I was in total survival mode. So it was years process, but I wasn't looking way back to the beginning, but that was a very healing point for me. Cause as we talk about the Holy spirit and him being a gentleman, he so kindly will help you go back and look back, even if you're not like I said, no, that's not your intention. And so for me, I remember this happened. I think I was listening to a song, like a worship song. It was, it might've been like a Bethel one. And I think it was a spontaneous one. And somehow they mixed in, I don't know, some song from childhood or whatever. And it just hit me. Like the Holy spirit just was enveloping me and reminded me of, or gave me a word picture. And I'm not this person. Yes, I'm a writer and descriptive, but I am not like always trying to go into my past and make all these things happen. Like I'm not that person. That's my sister. (laughs) But anyways, I just out of nowhere, later I went on, I'm at my computer doing work and I just get this like word picture of myself. I don't know if, I don't even know if I've shared this before, but sitting under a desk in the first house I grew up in, not the one I described, sitting under this desk all by myself. For me, like when I go back, I look at being on my own a lot. And I remember my parents fighting and then I'd be in my room all alone. And I have memories of just having deep thoughts, probably just a deep person, whatever, sitting on the edge of my bed, what is life? But I, so I picture myself in this room and I'm under this desk with like shelves above it. So like a built-in desk. And I just have this like imagery of Jesus sitting next to me that I was never like in that room alone. I was, he was always with me and just sitting under there. So I was probably like hiding under there, but he was right there with me. But it was so vivid that afterwards, I didn't remember that desk, built-in desk being in the room. I remember the room, but I don't remember that part. And I was so like caught off guard that I had called my mom and I was like, mom, was there like a built-in desk in the corner of this room next to the green drapes? I remember the green drapes because they were like the color of the Wicked Witch of the West's face. And I was freaked out every night. But, and she said, yeah, there was in the corner. It was like bookshelves and then a built-in little desk thing. And I said... Okay. Wow. So that to me was just the kindness of God. I wasn't digging and looking, but he was like, we're going to, we have to like work on this thing where you always feel alone. And I keep, he keeps bringing me back to that image, even like a couple weeks ago, because my response when I feel pain or hurt, or there's a, um, argument or something like I'll feel immediate rejection. And then I want to retreat which has always has been like to my room or to my closet for a long time. I write a lot about the closet in my book. Now I don't have a big enough closet to go into, but I want to retreat. And the other day I was thinking about that because God brought it up to me and was just showing me like, that's because that was your first coping mechanism was you were in a room alone and you had to learn to deal with things and you have a hard time dealing with things, responding to things, emotionally regulating, really, if you can't go off and be in a room, but it originates from there. So anyways, that was a long story, but I just want to let people know that God is so kind. And I think our origin stories very much play into where we are today, our emotional maturity. I have a whole chapter on that because your emotional age has nothing to do with your chronological age. And this has been a whole process of me growing up 
And the great news is that God is a parent, right? So he is patient and he parents us through the whole process. Thank you for sharing that story. That's sacred space. Really appreciate you sharing that Mm -hmm. sacred space. Yeah. And I love it that you ended on God as a parent, because I think Mm -hmm. there's so many of us here today who that's what we need. And we need to know that God is our parent. I remember this day, I was feeling pretty heartbroken and we've had some harsh words with somebody in my family. And I was driving, I was actually moving. I was on my way to move to a new city. I had just taken a job at at a nonprofit and I was on my way there. I was just tears and tears. And the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. said to me, Christy, it's always been me and you. (laughs) Those words, hey, it's always been me and you. Like, Mm -hmm. don't worry about that. That, That's Mm -hmm. a painful thing. Don't worry about that right now. You Mm -hmm. just need to know that I'm here. It's always been me and you and it's Mm -hmm. always going to be me and you. And whew, that's what our, yeah. our hearts need so much. If I can say yeah. too, I know that can be, it can be tricky by saying God is a parent, God is a father. A lot of times how we view God as a father has so much to do with our earthly fathers. And I know so many people, so many women have had difficult situations with their fathers and have father wounds. And so that can make it really difficult. My grandma, who was a hero of mine, not long before she died, she said to me, Trina, God is everything that you have ever wished for in a father and more. So whatever ideas we may have about God, like we, we have to really try not to link it to how our earthly fathers might've behaved towards us or ignored us or treated us wrongly or whatever the issue is, God is, he is not that he is patient and he is kind and he calls us to hard things and to obey and to make changes in our life and to be a fully functioning son or daughter in his kingdom. Yeah. He's a father. There's it's not all just puppies and rainbows and all of that, but he's so kind in the way and thoughtful and smart and wise in the way that he parents us. So I just want to encourage anyone, maybe those words that my grandma shared with me might resonate with you. Maybe your heart needs to hear that anything that you ever wished for in a father, God is that and so much more. So good. It's also when thinking about how to discern God's voice, God has said some things to me that were a little Mm -hmm. hard to hear, never been discouraged walking away from the conversation. It's not God's voice. If you just feel like so condemned and discouraged and all this stuff, you you might feel convicted. You might be like, Ooh, okay. But you're always going to feel encouraged at the same time. Yes. That is a good word. Yeah. Okay. So also we do have an episode called healing from father wounds. So if you're listening Mm. today and you have father wounds, you can go back in the archives and listen to that. Okay, Trina, last question. If you were to give your younger self some words Mm. of encouragement, oh, what old would she be and what would you tell her? I think she would be, boy, the younger one that I described in that room, she was just too little to know anything going on. So I'd probably have to be like my junior high, like going into high school years, like eighth grade, ninth grade, probably. And I think I would tell her that you might, feel lonely often, but to learn to be at home with yourself, age you are, whatever stage to just learn to be at home with yourself. And of course with God, but God makes his home in you and he has made you the way that he's made you for a purpose. So don't try to fight that and to just be present. I was always the little girl that was trying to be older and go on to the next stage and the next. And my mom was always warning me, (laughs) even when I had little babies, you're going to miss this. And then there's this and that. And I think now it's finally hit. It took me a long time to realize that today is the day that we live in. And the past is a place you can visit and tomorrow we don't know. So live in today and be at home with yourself. At home with yourself. I love it. Yeah. And maybe don't, the older I get to, and we're talking about change and this book is, I don't want to call it like self-help. I come from a long line of self-help readers. I love self-help books, but I guess I describe it like a spiritual growth, but you can spend so much time trying so hard to work on yourself, but it's not the same as letting God work in you. So 
I hope that if anyone gets this book and reads it, or as they're listening to this conversation, like that you take any pressure off yourself. You don't have to try so hard. You just have to participate and you just have to have a willing heart and a willing soul and let God do the work in you. You get to do it together. So it's not about trying so hard and mustering up and what's the word everyone likes to use that I don't like hustling. <laughs> it's not, it's not about that. It's really about more about rest and the thing we didn't talk about, but I just want to add this to in this uncluttering your soul process. There's no timeline. Like you're on your own journey. I'm on my own journey. The only one that should be concerned about how long it's taking you to heal from certain things, to grow in certain areas is the Lord. Nobody else might understand your timeline, but he does. And it's perfect. So just participate with him. Unclutter your soul, overcome what overwhelms you. Thank you, Trina McNeely, for being with us today. We will put a link to your book in the show notes. So if you're listening today and you want to get this book to support you in this process, and we'll link it there for you. Thank you, Trina. Awesome. Thank you, Christy. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you enjoy this episode, please share it with a friend and invite her to be part of our community. Also, you can become an insider and get a free guide we wrote just for you at wonderfullymade.org. Talk to you next time.